Hello everyone and welcome back to the Netherworld Bibliotheque where I will be doing another book review. So today I will be talking about The Ineffable Name, A Crafter's Guide to Traditional Witchcraft. This book is by George Hares and has a foreword by Gemma Gary. It was first published in 2022. Now if you're asking yourself, what is traditional witchcraft? Well, stick around because this book covers all that and more, including traditional gods, um, traditional tools, and rituals performed by traditional witches. But first, what is traditional witchcraft? The author says this is a practice that is pre-Gardanian and pre-Alexandrian Wicca. It is a combination of practices coming from the witch trial times, so the 15th century, up until the repeal of the Witchcraft Act in the UK in 1951. Now here I will point out that we are talking about British traditional witchcraft, um, just want to make that clear, and that also there will be regional differences and that also there will be um, personal preferences. The author does a good job of explaining what traditional witchcraft is, but here I'm just giving you a quick overview. He also mentions that traditional witchcraft is influenced by Luciferianism, Christianity and paganism. He does a really good job of explaining how these things have come to be incorporated and into traditional witchcraft and how they can work um, alongside. Again, I'm just doing a review. If it sounds intriguing, I would always encourage you to purchase the book. Alrighty, so after we establish what is traditional witchcraft, the next section of the book looks at the tools that a traditional witch would use. Um, so these are things like an altar, the stang, the axis mundi, uh, mortar and pestle, uh, various different stones such as a hearthstone or a hagstone, uh, so on and so forth. Um, the book goes through every single one explaining what it is, what it's supposed to do, how you're supposed to use it. I'm just going to pick just one to talk about to give you an idea of the type of information that is included. Um, and of course, I should state that once again, there could be regional differences. So in different parts of the country, it might make more sense to use particular tools that are better connected to um, the land or agriculture in that area. And once again, personal practices, um, because everyone's craft is their own. So I'm not saying that these are tools that every single traditional witch will use all of the time, but this is a list of the most commonly found tools. Um, all right, so the one that I wanted to focus on is the stang. If you're wondering what is that, um, so it is a staff which um, is forked at the top. Uh, sometimes it will have a candle in the middle. So the two forks at the top are meant to represent the horns of the old one. This is one of the gods in traditional witchcraft that's covered uh, later on in the book. Sometimes there is a candle in between the horns. This is supposed to represent the divinity within us all. Um, and then typically there is also a nail in the bottom of the staff. Um, I think it is made from ashwood. I do, I do believe traditionally the stang is made from ashwood. Um, it can also be used um, as an altar when it's taken outdoors. Oh, in terms of what is it? So um, traditional witchcraft really believes in spiritualism or the spirit world, and it believes in a divide between the spirit world above and our mon mundane world down here. So the stang is supposed to represent um, uh, sort of bridging this gap and letting like the spirits in the spirit world come into our mundane world. Again, the book does a much better job of explaining what is the stang, where does it come from, um, who, populi who popularized it and how you can work with it. Um, I'm just doing a quick overview uh, to give you an idea of what the content is. If you find it intriguing, again, I always encourage you to purchase the book and support the author. Uh, one of the interesting points that the author does make that I think is worth noting is he says that um, he did used to take the stang outdoors for his ritual work, but 
because he lives in the city and um, he has to take public transport, he has found that it brings him some unwanted attention. Um, so he's found uh, it's better to leave it at home and to substitute the stang for something called a bull roarer or a wind roarer. If you're thinking, what is that? <laughs> um, don't worry, I, I didn't know either. So it's a uh, long piece of wood. It's like um, rectangular shaped, attached to a string. Um, and then you like spin it in the air and it makes a sound I would say kind of like an airplane passing overhead, which would make sense because if you think of like the engine of, a, of an airplane, that is essentially what the, um, what the wind roarer is doing. Um, so I will also link to a video in the description section if you want to see one of these things in action. So moving on, the next section of the book looks at uh, witch gods. Um, again, it goes through a list of various ones. I'm just going to pick one just to give you an example of the kind of information that is included. I've decided to tell you about Tubal Khan. So Tubal Khan is a Judeo-Christian character. He is the first blacksmith and um, he's said to be able to make anything out of bronze and iron. And you might be thinking, all right, cool, but what does that have to do with witchcraft? Um, so in a lot of folklore, there is this overlap between witchcraft and blacksmithery because blacksmiths can take um, the metal and transform it into whatever they want. So people do look at it as like, how did you do that? How do you have that power to transform nature? It must be witchcraft. Um, and then there is sometimes a little bit of a fear because, well, if the blacksmith can do that to metal, what can they do to me? Um, and this is something that um, I've seen before. So in one of my, I, I personally haven't wit witnessed like a blacksmith performing witchcraft. Sorry, that's not what I mean. Um, I mean, this topic has been covered before. In one of my previous uh, book reviews about The Evil Eye by Jack Shamash, um, he does talk about some cultures where people believe that blacksmiths can cast the evil eye upon you. Again, because uh, they're thought to have some kind of supernatural power because they can work metal. But I digress, what was I saying? Um, so yes, Tubal Khan, who is a Judeo-Christian character, and you might be thinking, okay, cool, what does that have to do with witchcraft? Um, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so the other overlap is the Mark of Cain, because uh, Tubal Khan is one of the blood relatives of Cain, as in Cain and Abel. Um, so the story goes that Cain murdered his brother Abel, and God punished him twofold. So he said, firstly, um, you will farm in vain anywhere where you farm now. Um, the, gr the ground will not yield you any crop. So now you have to go be a desperate wanderer. And Cain said, like, this is a terrible thing to do to me. It's more than I could bear. Like, just kill me. Just put me out of my misery. And God said, no, I'm actually going to put a mark upon you. This is now the mark of Cain. Um, and this warns people to not kill you, to not put you out of your misery. If they do that, then they will suffer your fate several times over. So no, no, no one is to kill you. Um, so the mark of Cain can be interpreted either literally or metaphorically in um, traditional witchcraft um, to represent someone that is a natural witch. They have natural witchcraft abilities or they have the witch fire inside them. The witch fire um, is again going back to the candle in between the horns of the stang. It's um, the spark of divinity within us. Uh, so Tubal Khan is one of the gods that traditional witches can work with. And this book does also contain a ritual for how you can uh, call upon Tubal Khan um, to help rouse your witch fire. Uh, it's quite a simple ritual. You just need to be in the darkness uh, by yourself. You just need a candle and your imagination. So quite easy to perform. If you want the details, as always, I would encourage you to purchase the book. So that is about the first half of the book, I would say. Then the second half of the book is really looking at working with nature, working with local um, gods and spirits, learning to um, listen to them and watch out for synchronicities because this is how they speak to you. Um, there are then several different rituals and it's explained um, what is the purpose of this ritual, how to perform it, um, various different anecdotes. Um, and then lastly, at the end, there are a number of um, resources. But one thing that I, th I thought was very important, or it seems obvious, like once I read it, I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? But like, <laughs> this idea never came to me naturally. Um, if you're interested in a particular type of witchcraft, whether that is traditional witchcraft or any other type, 
um, go and look at the original sources. So with traditional witchcraft, a lot of our accounts come from the 15th century witch trials. Okay, what documents do we have? What particular spells are noted? What particular um, grimoires are noted? Go back to the original sources of the witchcraft that you're interested in if you want to practice it or become adept at it. And that makes so much sense now that I am aware of it, but it's just not an idea that I had naturally. Um, but yes, uh, mentioning several resources, uh, it does remind me of this other video that I watched by um, The Witch of Wonderlust. And she was talking about introductory texts to witchcraft, and she was saying that if it doesn't have additional sources at the end, then it's not a good book. Um, I wouldn't go that far. I think the information can still be credible even if they don't provide you with other sources, but I think it is an, an added bonus if they do that. <laughs> anyway, back on topic. Um, the, last, the last part, the conclusion of this book, is um, this really nice sort of personal note from the author. Um, he talks about your craft being your craft. It's not something that you need to justify to someone else. And that's a point that he makes throughout the book. Um, and it is also um, something that he talks about in more personal detail. He talks about how practitioners and non-practitioners have been critical about his craft um, throughout his life. But he has this really good quote. Um, let me just look up who the original author is one second. Alrighty, I'm back. So um, we have George Hares quoting Andrew Chumley, who says, If somebody knocks on the door and the gods answer, then who am I to question the integrity of their path? So that's something that I completely agree with. I think that your spiritual practice is yours. And we can never know what someone else is thinking or feeling. So if you believe that you are doing something sincerely and honestly, if you indeed believe that you have a connection with a god or it makes sense to you to use a certain tool or not use a certain tool, um, who, who am I to judge that? Who am I to say that you're doing it incorrectly? So I, I completely agree that your spiritual craft is yours. It's just for you, if it makes sense to you, go ahead. You don't need to justify it to anyone else. Um, yeah, so that's the book in a nutshell. Um, in terms of uh, my thoughts on it, my commentary, I really enjoyed it for several reasons. Um, so I, as I mentioned in a previous video, I was talking about upcoming book reviews. Um, one thing that I really like is that it focuses specifically on traditional witchcraft. And as I've said previously, a lot of introductory witchcraft books, especially in English, um, just the same generic information. So you could be forgiven for thinking that all witches use crystals and all witches practice candle magic, um, all witches celebrate the Wheel of the Year, because a lot of introductory texts just give the same information over and over. And you would think, okay, if someone is a witch, that's what they do, that's what they practice. And it's like, yes, some people who identify as witches, but not all of them, witchcraft is broad. So I really like this, that this book was specifically about um, traditional witchcraft in the UK, and it still made allowance for regional differences and for personal preference. The other thing I really liked is um, this book is written in a very uh, conversational tone, very informal, so it's very easy to read. Um, there's a little bit of humour in there as well. You can see a bit of the author's personality. Uh, so it was really easy and engaging to read. It was like as if um, the author was in front of you and, and the two of you are having a conversation. It was that kind of um, uh, vibe, I suppose. I hate the word vibe, but here we are. Um, yeah, so I I would recommend this book if you want to know specifically about traditional witchcraft. What What is it? Who do you worship? What tools do you use? Uh, what are some spells or rituals that I can do? Um, and it does also address the topic a little bit of if you live in the city and you're trying to practice this craft, which is about connecting with nature, um, what are some of the ways that you can do that? So I thought that was really helpful as well. All right, that's it. Thank you for stopping by. Let me know, do you have this book or do you recommend any other sources for traditional witchcraft? Um, oh, and I completely forgot to mention, so the author, he is also a fellow YouTuber, so I will, of course, um, link to his page in the description section. I hope that everyone stuck around to the end to hear me say that, otherwise, oh my God, that was such useful information. I should have put that in the beginning. Oh well, live and learn. That's what I get for trying to do all these videos in one take. Anyway, that's it for today. Thank you for stopping by and maybe I will see you next time.